Welcome back to Minimum Effort, Maximum Derp. I am your host and paranormal investigator, you may call me Mello. Today I am here to discuss the Grinning Man of Route 77. A mysterious entity known to appear during times of intense UFO activity. No one really knows too much about him, despite being very open to answering any questions his contactees may ask of him. Having been spotted all over the world, and by world, I pretty much just mean America. <laughs> Numerous sightings occurring in New Jersey, Texas, West Virginia, and even Massachusetts. Now, although the Grinning Man is most famous for his appearances in West Virginia during the 1960s Mothman sightings, so much so that some people even believe him to be the Mothman, our story begins in Elizabeth, New Jersey, a state that, interestingly enough, has never had a Mothman sighting. Now, to be clear, I will be reading from John Keane's personal notes, as he was the one who interviewed the two eyewitnesses. There is a more detailed version floating around online, but as I am not sure who wrote that version, and there being quite a few differences between them, I thought I'd keep things safe and read the version written by the actual interviewer during the interviews. In the weeks prior to the original sighting, there were rumors circulating throughout New Jersey of a large man who would chase people down in the streets at night, and many more UFO sightings. One such UFO sighting occurred within the same hour as the event we are about to discuss. Shortly after 10.30 p.m. on the night of October 10th, 1966, Two teenage boys were wandering the streets, headed towards a nearby shop for an EXCITING game of pinball. They were passing the corner on East Jersey Street and 4th Street, when James Jimmy Yankitis poked his friend Martin Mouse Munol and said, Hey, there's somebody behind us. Mouse turned around and they both saw a strange person. The strange person that the boys saw was standing behind a high wire fence which encloses the steep embankment leading up to the busy Jersey Turnpike. The Turnpike is a multi-laned super highway elevated about 30 feet above street level. The fence along 4th Street is about 8 feet high and would be most difficult to climb. There is no way to get over or through this fence from the street. A low, narrow, steel and concrete rail runs along the edge of the turnpike itself and would be possible for a person to climb over the rail and work his way down the fence. But he would find himself trapped by the fence and unable to reach the street. It would be difficult for a motorist to park his car on the busy turnpike. And it would not be sensible for anyone to climb down the embankment if they needed help. Nevertheless, the two boys claimed they saw a person standing behind the fence. He was far too big to be human, said Jimmy. From the reflection of the streetlight, it looked like he had an auto mechanic's work suit. Sort of green and glittery. It looked like he had a bald head, and his eyes were embedded in his head. You know, like Chinese, flat, level with his face. I didn't see any nose, but he had a very large mouth. Now, as far as I can tell, the only odd thing this man has done is be large and look Chinese. So I can't help but wonder if these two boys had simply seen a Chinese man. Because as of right now, it sounds like they just saw this guy. When Jimmy first noticed this being, he seemed to be standing on the other side of the fence, about 10 feet away from the boys. As the boys stopped to look at him, he slowly turned his head towards them and flashed a strained grin, which startled and frightened them. I was scared because he was so big, Mouse declared later. His eyes were real small and real far apart. They, had, they, were, they were round and meaty. And when he grinned, his mouth was real big and full of white teeth. He had a nasty grin. Just how big was he, one of our investigating party, Chuck McCain? 
I'm sorry, what? Why? I searched and I searched for any reason why famed actor and children's television star Chuck McCain would be there. The best I found was that John Keel, the interviewer, was a writer on the Chuck McCain show that had ended a few months prior. But as for why John Keel convinced a past co-worker of his, to come with him on a two-hour drive with himself and James Mosley to interview some kids on a possible alien slash Chinese man sighting. I haven't a clue. In any case, Chuck McCain, McCain a large, well-padded six-footer, stood up. Mouse looked at him appraisingly. He was lots bigger than you, Mouse observed. Broader. He had very broad shoulders. Broader than me? Chuck mused. Well, that's a first. For context, Chuck McCain 6'3". <laughs> Both boys, we <laughs> interviewed them separately, said they thought he might have been seven feet tall. John Keel and company cross-examined them carefully, and they appeared to be telling the truth. He was wearing black coveralls, like an auto mechanic's wear, Mouse said. He had on a big black belt, maybe three inches wide. He was colored, you know, real black. And I didn't see any nose or ears or hair. The boys did not linger to examine him more closely. Genuinely frightened by his immense size, they ran away without looking back. <coughs> Later, they wondered how he could have gotten behind the fence. Okay, the no nose, ears, or hear thing is rather weird. Not necessarily alien-like, but definitely strange. Granted, the man was reportedly ten feet away, behind a fence, under a bridge, it was getting pretty dark out, and the two boys immediately ran away from him at the first glance. So it is possible he was just a large, bald Chinese guy? And they just didn't see the nose or ears? But let's keep going. They did not report this incident to anyone until the next day when they heard a rumor that a tall creature had pursued a 50-year-old man down 2nd Street around 11 p.m. on the night of the 10th, which is one night prior than their run-in. I don't know how John Keane found out about this either. They explained that they never told the police, and even if they did, I don't know why the police would contact them. And no newspaper ever ran the story. They did tell someone, probably their parents, these are kids after all, about what they saw the day after the sighting occurred. But somehow, John Keen found out about the sighting within 12 hours of the two boys telling their parents about this scary-looking Chinese man they saw. And then he got his two friends, Chuck McCain and James Mosley, to take a two-hour drive with him on a Thursday night just to search all of New Jersey in the hopes that they just so happened to knock on the right door and get these two children's house. After a long discussion with one of my friends, we came to the conclusion that there were only two logical answers as to how this happened. The first put forward by my friend that these two kids would naturally think to contact someone who could help spread the news of a possible alien sighting, so they would call someone from TV, such as Chuck McCain, famed children's television star. Chuck McCain, then knowing about John Keane's interest in the matter, would have invited him to come down and interview these kids with him. And there is the idea I put forth, that since these two boys waited so long to tell anyone about this sighting, and it would have been near impossible for this rumor to reach John King within the allotted time, and then for John King to also just so happen to find the two correct children in all of New Jersey, that the only person that could have told John Keane about the incident would be the only other person at the sighting. That's right. It was, of course, the Grinning Man himself that told John Keane about the incident. 
It all makes sense when you realize that John King was in cahoots with the alien, perhaps even an alien himself. And before you say the idea is crazy, I would like to say that John King has openly talked about how he would get phone calls from the Grinning Man, though I do not believe he ever discussed what he said. As for the rumor the two boys heard, the one about the 50-year-old man that was attacked, the man is supposed to have run the local restaurant and was in such a hysterical state that he was taken to the Alexian Brothers Hospital nearby. John Keen and crew made a thorough attempt to run this rumor down, but the local police had not heard the story and the only restaurant on 2nd Street was not open that late. Walton's Pizzeria was not involved according to its owner. They decided not to check the hospital and the local press did not carry either story. Oh, and did I mention that these two boys, Martin Mouse Munov and James Jimmy Yankitis, had never been heard from again? Or prior? Yeah, I want to get this one out of the way first because it just actually sounds like a dream that John Kill had, and he forgot it didn't actually happen, so he included it in his book, The Mothman Prophecies. Which remains the only context these two boys were ever mentioned in. Not only is this the only known interview with them, it becomes much worse when you acknowledge the fact that everything the boys said was different in the published version than it was in John Keane's notes, implying that at best, John took a few artistic liberties in writing this out. Another encounter attributed to the Grinning Man by John Keane occurred in April 1967 in Point Pleasant, West Virginia. The Lilly family reported an array of phenomena. Poltergeist activity popping off left and right, chairs stacking themselves up, objects being thrown, cars near their house would stall, TVs turning themselves on and off, the television interference would precede the appearance of colorful lights in the sky. According to Miss Lily, we've seen all kinds of strange things. Blue lights, green lights, red lights, lights that would change color. Some lights have even been so low that we thought we could see diamond-shaped windows in them, and none of them lights make any noise at all. The incident involving the Grinning Man, however, did not happen to the entire family, but focused on the Lily's daughter, Linda. She had woken up one night to see a hulking figure leering down at her while she was in bed. In Linda's own words, it was a man, a big man, very broad. I couldn't see his face very well, but I could see that it was grinning at me. He walked around the bed and stood right over me. I screamed again and hid under the covers. When I looked again, he was gone. Linda then ran into her mother's room, shrieking hysterically. There is a man in my room, there is. She refused to sleep alone for months following the encounter. Now personally, I don't really see the relevance of these two first encounters. The first one, as I discussed in detail, sounds like these two boys simply saw a tall Asian man in the dark and ran away from him. The second one sounds like it could literally be anything. Ghosts, aliens, sleep paralysis, the goddamn Aurora Borealis. It could literally be anything. The only connection there is to the Grinning Man is that Linda Lilly saw an apparition grin at her. Not to mention that once again, I really couldn't find any evidence to support that these were real people. I have no proof that John Keane did not just make up either of these stories. Ultimately, these encounters are so different to this next encounter and to each other that it's hard to say that it's even the same entity. But this next one, I feel is special, for better or for worse. Our third story, often called The Cold Who Came Down in the Rain, and really the only one worth talking about, is brought to us by Woodrow Durenberger. 
and has next to nothing to do with John Keane. We have here the actual interview with Darren Berger when he came on WTAP TV to be interviewed by Ronald Maines to discuss what had happened to him. And for the first time in this video, I'm going to let an actual recorded interview with real existing people do most of the talking. Whether or not you believe in unidentified flying objects or not is not the point. Whether you believe in what you hear or see on this program is not the point. We are here to talk to a man that allegedly did make contact with such an object within the Parkersburg area last evening, November the 2nd, 1966, at approximately 7.25 p.m. The incident allegedly took place on Interstate Highway 77 near the interchange of Route Number 47. Mr. Dernberger, in your own words, would you please relate what happened last night? There was a car passed me, overtaking me from behind, and following closely behind this car was this unidentified flying object. And as the car ahead, or the car behind passed me, this object was following close behind it, and it swerved directly in front of my truck, turning crosswise. And when it turned crosswise, it slowed down. It started slowing, not abruptly or too fast, but it gave me plenty of time to step on my brakes and slow down with it. But it forced me to come to a complete stop. As soon as I had stopped, there was a door opened in the side of this vehicle, and this man stepped out and came directly to me, or came to the truck. He walked to the right-hand side of the truck, and he told me to roll down the window. He asked me to roll down the window on my right-hand side of my truck. And I had done what he asked. And this man stood there, and, and he told me, he said, uh, I would like to talk to you. And uh, I just couldn't answer him. I just couldn't speak. And at that, that is the first time he told me not to be frightened. He said he wished me no harm. And... Uh, he talked a little bit in this vein. He asked me why. He said, why are you frightened of us? He said, we are the same as you. He said, we eat, we breathe, we sleep, we bleed, even as you do. He said, we are like you. He, and he said, please be not frightened. He said he was called Cold. That was the name that he was called by. Again, he told me not to be frightened, which I was. I was, I was very frightened. And as far as I can understand, this was all mental. There was no spoken words from him. I knew what he was asking me, but yet he stood there and his mouth did not move. He had a smile on his face. He, was, he appeared very courteous and friendly. And after I talked with him a while, he told me he would see me. He said, we will see you again, and he left in his vehicle. I just want to acknowledge how freaky it would be for an alien to force you to pull over to the side of the highway at night and repeatedly jam messages into your brain about how you shouldn't be afraid. Why do they have to do all that? Can't we just meet up at like a Taco Bell? I, I, for one, would be much more comfortable with the paranormal if they would just meet up at a public location at a reasonable time of day. This interview is what helped piece together the many events of injured colds and is now kept in the Mothman Museum. After the interview aired, others came forward with claims that they had also seen a figure matching Darren Berger's description of injured colds. One man reported that a man matching injured Colt's description tried to flag him down, but he was too afraid to stop. Other people claimed to see lights and fluttering vehicles on the road Durenberger said he talked to Colt on, and several witnesses confirmed that they had even seen Durenberger stopped on the road talking to this man. It is also worth noting that the interviewer mentioned that this isn't the only time something like this has happened in recent history. 
Mr. Dernberger, we have a program on radio called the Joe Pine Show, and Mr. Pine interviews extraordinary people in various uh, that are involved in various uh, occupations and and some non-occupational type of uh, businesses. And have you, have you ever heard of Joe Pine? No, I haven't. Never. I don't believe I have. All right. Uh, on one of his recent broadcasts. He talked with a man, he interviewed a man who had not only had somewhat similar, uh, somewhat similar experience to what you had last evening, but uh, this gentleman went one step further, and he had taken, uh, been taken aboard a spaceship, which, by the way, was uh, described quite similar, similarly to what you described this particular ship. Uh, and this ship, uh, with these people who looked like we do and so forth, took him to Venus and took him to Mars and brought him back home again. Now, you may be wondering if Woodrow Durenberger ever saw Cold again. After all, Cold said he would, and it has been over 50 years since the events took place. Well, would you be surprised to find out that Durenberger and Cold became good friends and would hang out regularly? Cold would even visit Durenberger's home, where Cold met Durenberger's wife and daughter. Durenberger even met other grinning men called Seekers. They introduced themselves as Demo Hassan and Carl Ardo. Not much is known about these two except that Durenberger's wife did not trust them. In the years that followed, Durenberger would have many more encounters with injured Cold. One time, Durenberger just up and disappeared for six months, and when he got back, claimed that Cold took him on a spaceship to his home planet known as Lanulos of the Genie Medes galaxy, roughly 14.6 light years away, where he would go on to learn much about the Lanulos people, their desire for friendly contact, and their religions. Now this is one of the most damning pieces of information in this entire case. The reason why is that 14.6 light years away is still well within the Milky Way. The Milky Way is actually about 100,000 light years across. Now the best thing I can say in defense of this is that perhaps Woodrow Durenberger just didn't know the difference between a galaxy and a solar system. Because there is actually a solar system 14.6 light years away from our sun. The red flare star TZ Arietes, found within the Aries constellation's borders, is believed to have at least three planets none of which are considered likely to have life, seeing as red dwarfs are very volatile, emitting huge flares of deadly radiation. Unfortunately, that radiation can strip a planet of its atmosphere if it's too close to the star. However, in a recent discovery, scientists now believe that these super flares erupt from the poles of the stars, putting these planets back into a theoretical habitable zone. Look, long story short, it's possible. It's not likely, but it is possible. In any case, here are a few interesting things I thought I would share about the culture of Lanulos. Number one, they believe in one God, the father of all and the creator of all that is good. Number two, they have developed a non-hostile manner and have no crime or war. The Lanulosians were apparently caught off guard when they came here. They wanted to establish trade between our planets, but their attempts to form a relationship with Earth were rebuffed when we started to shoot them. Cold indicated that he had also received wounds from a shotgun on one occasion. The Lanulosians have no need of clothes, and generally walk around in the nude. When Durenberger first visited the planet, he found he attracted stares because of his clothing, and soon adopted the local custom. Durenberger also reported that he had traveled to Venus, and that its residents were also nudists. Life on Venus is still a long shot. 
After all, it's long been believed that if life does exist elsewhere in our solar system, then Mars would be the most likely place to look. That is, until the year 2020. Science Minister Amanda Soloway said, This discovery is immensely exciting! Astronomers discovered signs of life on Venus when they detected a chemical, phosphine, in the thick Venus atmosphere. David Grinspoon of the Planetary Science Institute in Tuscan, Arizona, had this to say. That is pretty damn exciting! After much analysis, the scientists assert that something now alive is the only explanation for the chemical source. Research scientist Janusz Petkowski, in an interview with Boston Globe, said, This is exciting! Now, the only way to prove the existence of phosphine in Venus's atmosphere is to go there and take samples of their environment. Fortunately, we already did this in 1978 during the Pioneer 13 mission. Sarah Dodson Robinson, associate professor of physics and astronomy at the University of Delaware, said, It's exciting. This NASA probe deployed an instrument called the Large Probe Neutral Mass Spectrometer, or LNMS, in Venus's atmosphere. And it appears to have found signs of phosphine, which in turn suggests a high probability of life on Venus. Sanjay LeMay, a planetary scientist at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, says, EXCITING! I don't know about you, but I found this all to be very... exciting. Now that I'm done with my rant about Venus, number four. Marriage is commonplace among the Lanalusians. When a couple marries, they are united. The male refers to his spouse as his union, and a female calls her husband her united. Hmm. Quote from Mrs. Durenberger. It was at this second meeting, the night of November 4th, that Cold told me about himself. Hold is married, his wife is named Kimmy, and he had two sons at that time. Has three children now, one was born right around Christmas time, a little girl. Well, there you go, four things you now know about Lanulos. Durenberger told his story frequently over the next few years, and in 1971, with the assistance of Harold W. Hubbard, he authored a book-length account of his adventures, Visitors from Lanulos. In the aftermath of it all, the experience seemed to have negatively impacted Durenberger's life in irreparable ways, even extending to his family and close friends. The consequence took its toll with years of harassing phone calls, some of which may have been from the men in black. He lost his job, friends turned their backs on him, people were constantly trespassing on his property, public ridicule, threats, migraines, depression, and his wife divorced him, believing these beings were evil. Durenberger was also having an affair, which probably didn't help. Durenberger left the area for some time to get away from the notoriety and try to live a normal life. John Kill the author I complained about earlier visited Durenberger a year after the incident and found him hiding behind drawn curtains from what he believed were hundreds of UFO believers and skeptics, saying that injured Cold and his friends frequently visited the farm, often arriving by automobile for long, friendly chats. John Keel came to the conclusion that Durenberger had almost certainly become delusional. An investigation concluded that Durenberger was not a fraud or a hoaxer, but hallucinations could not be ruled out. And in the end, he never denied his claims. He simply stopped talking about them. Near the end of his life, he moved back to West Virginia and passed away in 1990. So who or what was injured cold? There are many who believe him to be a ghost. Some say he is the Hindu deity Indra. Others say he was an alien from outer space. 
quite possibly the alien known as Valiant Thor, a alien who lived in an apartment in the Pentagon while on a mission to end the threat of nuclear war, but packed his things and moved out and became a Christian when he realized the president was completely useless. And many more believe he was just some guy that Darren Berger met on the side of a highway. I will leave you with this, no matter what, Indrid Cold was a real person. This may not have been his real name, the things he said may have been a lie, but people met the guy, he had friends. Durenberger's wife, even after she left her husband, still believed in Injured Cold because she met him and had conversations with him. Their daughter, Tanya Durenberger Bowman, has openly talked about her memories of this man. Durenberger's friends and neighbors saw the guy. This is undeniably a real thing that happened, unlike the first two stories which may actually just have been made up. In the end, we may never know the truth. The only thing we can say for certain is that the 1960s were pretty damn weird. Thank you for watching and leaving a like. Comment down below what you believe the Grinning Man to be and or any other conspiracies you'd want me to check out. And subscribe if you want to see more of this content. Sing it.